Well, Britton and Ann, uh, thank you so much for making yourselves available today. Uh, looking forward to your presentation. Uh, you, we should be live on the city's Facebook page, and it looks like we have about 10 attendees in session tonight or today, and I will be helping to bring them forward as they use the chat function or the question and answer, and looking forward to another interesting discussion, Britton. Thanks so much, Nat. Um, so if you are new to our Tuesday talks, I'm Britton Bostick. I'm the downtown and historic planner for the city of Georgetown. That was Nat Wagner, the long range planning manager and joining us um, as always my special guest, Ann Evans, who is with our award winning Georgetown Public Library and is not only a reference librarian, but Ann is so knowledgeable about Georgetown history and she is a great colleague of mine um, and we really enjoy being able to share um, stories of old Georgetown with you. And we really love sharing photos. And so we thought um, school is now back um, for uh, people of all ages. You may be a teacher in your back to school, you may be um, in elementary, you may be in college, and everybody's coming back to school. And it's a really different looking school year this year. And so as we were talking about um, information that we had about past school years, we thought, wow, wouldn't it be um, kind of a fun time to look back and see what's the same and what's different? And if you think, oh, there's no way things are the same, we might have a few surprising stories for you about what hasn't changed, and you might be really surprised to see what has. So this is by no means a comprehensive look at Georgetown schools and their entire history. This is just a brief glimpse, um, and we're using the buildings um, as a way to focus what we're talking about. So we have some really fun stories, but um, by no means are we capturing them all. We're just hoping to highlight some things that you may not be aware of, may not be familiar with. Um, and we really wanted to show um, some buildings have come with us um, and some buildings have not. And we wanted to be able to talk about those differences. Um, and it turns out that Georgetown had no longer has a lot of the school buildings that we used to have. Um, and so hopefully we can entertain you, uh, give you some great information and help you to kind of see what it was like to go to school over 100 years ago um, and think about what that means for today. So whether uh, you're joining us from your home or on a school break from your office, we really appreciate it. And if you have questions, please feel free to um, put those in the chat. Nat will keep track of those for us. Um, feel free to raise your hand after we finish our presentation. We'd love to have questions and we'll provide contact information at the end. So let's get started on our back to school special. Um, and you had some really fun stories for this um, as usual. And um, really, whoops, there's the first photo. So school in Georgetown really is a lot of different things because we have elementary schools, we have middle schools, we have high schools, and we have a university. And it just so happens that we have one of the oldest universities in the state. And that's where our first photo comes from. Um, so people used to get pretty dressed up to go to school. It looks like definitely more dressed up than I ever got to go to school, I think. Not even on photo day? Um, I, I think I wore a t-shirt a couple of years, not gonna lie. <laughs> but when school started in Georgetown, and I have a couple of things I wanna read, um, and Anne, and you can kind of tell us what's going on in these photos. Um, there is a man who lived in Georgetown for about 20 years. He moved here at the end of 1879. And I think, he, I think he lived here until about 1900 or so before he moved um, back to the Texas coast. But he wrote this firsthand account of what Georgetown was like in 1879. And I'm gonna read it because it references schools. So this is from S.O. Eidman. And he said, when I moved to Georgetown in September AD 1879, there were but few nice buildings in Georgetown, not a single modern store building, a few old fashioned rough rock houses, no waterworks or electric plant, two blacksmith shops around the old courthouse square, a few stores and five large prosperous saloons, not a single nice church building or sidewalks and black muddy streets. And so he's telling us what his impression of Georgetown was in 1879. And then he was very involved in bringing Southwestern here, it appears. He said, I served as secretary and treasurer of a building committee with Dr. Mood, Dr. J.H. McGave, and Captain D.H. Snyder to build the first Methodist church south that was ever built in Georgetown, Texas. Dr. Mood, the founder of Southwestern University, 
preached for us in the old chapel, nor did we have a public school building. We had private school in an old frame building which seated some 15 or 20 children. The old chapel was a two-story rock building with four small rooms downstairs and two rooms upstairs, which composed the Southwestern University buildings. We hold Sunday school in the lower rooms and preaching in one of the upper rooms. So what kind of caught my attention here is he's talking about private school back in 1879. Yes, exactly. Um, school as we know it today didn't really exist in a public form until much later than we think it might have. We know there are public schools in Williamson County going back to at least 1854 because we have records of payment from the state to the county for 845 students attending Georgetown schools. Um, just so you know, today's enrollment is over 11,000. So that kind of gives oh. you an idea. <laughs> Of how Georgetown has changed over the last century. Um, but the vast majority of residents, the vast majority really of even Texas residents, didn't really trust public schools. Um, so most parents are sending their students to private schools, community schools, or parochial schools. Okay. And it's also really important to remember that Georgetown doesn't look like we think of it as today. It's not one giant city like it is today. It's really this conglomeration of all of these different small communities and kind of villages. And each one of those really has its own school. Because of course the primary mode of transportation is either horseback or walking. And no offense to education, but parents at that time are not gonna send the horse to school. They need the horse. <laughs> to um, you, you would have had to be pretty well off to be able to afford to have your children do anything but walk to school. Yes, exactly, exactly. So of course, all of the schools are really localized and there's actually more school districts documented in Williamson County in the 1850s and 60s than there are today. Because wow. then they start consolidating later on when transportation becomes easier. I will say, I just wanna throw this out there. There is one documented case of a child who could ride their horse to school and then they told the horse to go home and it understood that and it would go home and that was here in Georgetown. <laughs> so, so it could get sent back. Most horses were not that smart, unfortunately. My horse um, was not that smart. Yeah. That, was, that, wasn't, that wasn't gonna happen for me. So we think of, um, I think I especially think of Georgetown as the center of, of things. And so you have schools in Georgetown. So kids would just be walking into school to Georgetown to go to school. But you're telling me there were actually a lot of different schools and with pretty kind of close by to maybe where people were kind of smaller, yeah, there was a lot of farmland. Um, and so kind of smaller areas where schools were taking place and a lot of these were privately run. We didn't have um, like a strong public school system at the time. And a lot of these are buildings that did not survive with us uh, so, as we were talking about. So they're usually clapboard, a lot are named White House because of the whitewash that's used as paint on it. So these are two instances that you're seeing right here of those smaller community schools. Okay. And it looks like um, they have little bitty students. So do we know about the age of these students? So these guys look like they're younger grades. Um, sometimes if there were older students, that's when they might travel further to go to school. Um, so by the 1860s, we actually have the Georgetown Male and Female Academy operating here. It's again a private school in Georgetown. So if you're younger, you might be attending one of those local community schools. Also note how many of them are barefoot in this photograph, in these photographs. Um, and then if you want to continue your education, you might go further into Georgetown and come to someplace like the Male and Female Academy or the preparatory school which we know um, began operating here um, in the 1870s. So 1870s, about the time that S.O. Eidman um, is recounting in, in what he wrote of his firsthand account of Georgetown. So uh, on this slide, we're showing the Southwestern University Preparatory School. This is a building that did not come with us. We don't have this building anymore. Um, I, if I understand this correctly, Anne, this was 
originally the two stories and then the third floor was added later. Um, and it may surprise people to know that this is on University Avenue at the corner of University and Ash. Um, the other side, it's bounded by College Street. You may be more familiar with it as the Hammerlin Learning Center today, but this is the campus that we're talking about where this building was, um, right there kind of in the middle of our Old Town Historic District. And so by 1916, this is actually gone, or it's no longer a school. Um, so in the 1870s, Texas decided that local cities and municipalities could take over the school if they wanted to, but Georgetown didn't incorporate until 1894. So Georgetown votes to take over their school once they incorporate in January 1894. It was actually a vote of 237 residents in favor of taking over the school and one resident opposed. Of course. <laughs> And once Georgetown actually gains control of the public school, then you see an improvement. They start offering 10th and 11th grades in 1898. And then by 1916, they're offering University of Texas accredited classes because University of Texas was essentially TEA, the Texas Education Agency at that time. Um, so that's really where you see the decline of students in the preparatory school at Southwestern is as the public school system gets better in Georgetown. Okay. So when we say preparatory school, I found some Southwestern yearbook photos that show um, W.B. McMillan, A.B., principal of the fitting school, and then also some of the student teachers. So we do have a picture of what people who taught there looked like, but I didn't understand previously until I saw this in the yearbook that Southwestern would actually send student teachers over to the fitting school or the preparatory school as, as the teachers. I didn't understand that connection. And then it kind of serves as a teacher training. <laughs> which is great, um, which we have teacher training today. Um, maybe not exactly the same way, but um, usually if you're going to get a teaching degree um, or teaching certificate, you've got to get some of that practice in um, as a young teacher before you get your own classroom. So. Looks like they were doing a very similar thing. Um, this is from the 1916 Southwestern yearbook. And you can see um, really sharp dressers back then. So that's a lot of fun. Um, and you mentioned that this school was really kind of gone by 1916. We've got the Sanborn fire insurance maps of Georgetown, which help us to really understand what was on the ground at the time. So we can see this building still there in 1916. You can see it's associated with Southwestern University and the Methodist Church South. But by 1925, we had a completely different building there. And uh, I wanted to read another, this is kind of a fun find for me. Um, I wanted to read another um, account, which was written by a couple of researchers. So what's important about this Georgetown High School is, and this is a photo from 1934 um, showing the school. So that is where this three-story uh, preparatory school building had been. It got demolished and then it got replaced with this very modern high school, but there's quite a story behind it. And the two are very uh, kind of connected. Of course, they're on the same site, but um, this building is listed as a recorded Texas historic landmark, which means that it um, has a lot of significance at the state level. And Georgetown actually has, I think we have about 37 recorded Texas historic landmarks, meaning that not only do they have protections um, probably at the local level with our historic zoning, but they actually have state protections as well. Um, it's not as common. You have to request it and you have to go through quite a process. Part of that process is basically writing up the history and as much information as you can find about the building or about the site, providing that to the state so that they can review it um, because usually this is a designation that's really special. So this is a building that is still with us today in part because of how special it's considered to be um, and there's some fun connections. So I'm going to read um, what was written as part of this uh, recorded Texas historic landmark documentation and it says built in 1923-1924 on the original site of Southwestern University, this structure served as Georgetown High School for over 50 years designed by Austin architect Charles H. Page and exhibiting influences of the Spanish colonial revival style of architecture, the building features a Baroque entryway with cast stone detailing that includes motifs 
of shells, flowers, urns, and garlands, a gymnasium was added to the back of the building in the 1940s. The property now occupied by the Williams Middle School has served as, an, as a center of educational development for the community of Georgetown since shortly after the Civil War. In 1869, at the height of Reconstruction in Texas, a group of civic leaders began discussing the possibility of establishing a college in Georgetown. On January 29, 1870, they conducted an initial organization meeting where they elected officers for the project. Later, they planned a subscription campaign and selected a contractor to construct a college building on a site southeast of town. The land for the proposed Georgetown College was donated by John H. Dimmitt, or sorry, John J. Dimmitt and George W. Glasscock Jr., the latter acting on behalf of his father, the town's founder. So this is when we're getting that three-story building that we no longer have. Um, but simultaneous with, but independent of, the organization of Georgetown College was a series of meetings among the state's Methodist leaders to determine the future of their primary college in Texas, Seoul University at Chapel Hill in Washington County, and that's Brenham, closed during the Civil War and later devastated by the yellow fever epidemic of 1869. So yellow fever was carried by mosquitoes. Um, we're in West Nile fever season today, so yellow fever, there are some similarities there, but it could get really bad um, even in Texas. And so the yellow fever epidemic of 1867, the school and its facilities were in need of additional financial assistance and new direction. However, church officials were more concerned with the need for a centrally located college to serve the growing state and with predictions of a possible second outbreak of yellow fever. Consideration was given to such towns as Waxahachie, Waco, and Fort Worth, but the church leaders chose Georgetown as the site of their new college to be named Texas University. That might sound a little bit familiar to some of y'all. Dr. Francis Asbury Mood, who had directed Sewell University, was selected as the administrator of the new school. As he recalled, upon the reception of the news at Georgetown, of the dedication of the commissioners, there was great rejoicing, the firing of a hundred anvils expressing their great satisfaction at the result. And Anne, he says the firing of a hundred anvils, and that makes me kind of think blacksmith shop, would they have fired off guns in celebration of oh, yeah. Southwestern or coming here? Or possibly cannons, who knows? <laughs> so not, <laughs> we don't recommend that. Um, but apparently Georgetown was so excited at getting the, the new Methodist University that they fired off 100 guns um, or similar um, noisy excitement. Am, am, am. <laughs> <laughs> so to continue uh, what was written, officials of Georgetown College quickly offered their school building and campus for use by the Methodist school provided the contemplated state university be permanently located in Georgetown and it be made a first class institution of learning. The institution's proposed name was short lived, however, since the legislature already had plans to establish a University of Texas. So in 1875, Texas University was formally chartered by the state as Southwestern University, incorporating the earlier charters of such state Methodist schools as Sewell University and the colleges of Reutersville, Mackenzie and Westland. Since Reutersville, which was near the LaGrange, was the oldest, having been organized in 1840, that date is used to substantiate Southwestern's claim is the oldest institution of higher education in Texas. Um, so if you're curious about how Southwestern got here, there you go. Um, the early success of Southwestern University resulted in alterations to the original campus by the 1890s. In 1881, the two-story limestone college building was capped by a third floor that provided necessary classroom space. The evolution of the campus is chronicled by uh, Clara Scarborough in her book, Land of Good Water. So if you haven't read that book, that is kind of a, a really fun read about some of Georgetown's history. Um, completing the college complex was a series of cottages on adjacent streets that provided housing for faculty and staff in the ornate sanctuary of the First Methodist Church constructed southwest of the campus in 1891 uh, to 93. So there was a lot going on around the campus, um, but we know Southwestern didn't stay on this site. It actually moved just to the east where we know Southwestern to be today. And it says the formal relocation of Southwestern University was accomplished in 1900 with completion of a new main building. And that's the one that you can see at the corner of uh, Maple and University. The original building, the original main building was utilized as a preparatory school until 1916 when it sold to the city of Georgetown. 
with the sale of the historic educational site became a part of the public school system administered by the city council. The following year, the Texas legislature established the Georgetown Independent School District and control passed to the newly organized Board of Trustees. Among the issues facing the new board was the problem of overcrowded facilities. Initial plans called for utilization of the old college building, although some of the other structures on the site were raised. And so that's how we ended up getting this new high school was that there is a bond election held and the bond election was held for the purpose of constructing a new building. It passed, um, but the scope of the bond program was amended in 1922 to include remodeling the grammar school and construction of two high schools, one for whites and one for blacks. The election on the amended proposal was held on June 20th, 1922, with 428 voters in favor and 205 opposed. 14 construction bids were received with a contract awarded to Wattinger Brothers of Austin for the sum of $126,950. And so we can see in the photo I'm showing, it says 1923. Um, unfortunately, the building did not quite get completed in 1923. So this is kind of a, a long writing in this recorded Texas Historic Landmark documentation, but I think it provides us with some really helpful information and understanding what was going on in Georgetown at the time with our buildings. So it says prominent Austin architect Charles H. Page designed the new high school building to be constructed on East University. A native of St. Louis, Missouri, where he was born in 1876, Page moved to Texas with his family at the age of six. In Austin, his father worked as a contractor on projects that included the new state capitol. Young Page became interested in construction work, especially in the area of design. Although he lacked formal training from an architectural school, he acquired his professional expertise as an architect by studying with several prominent firms, and he later served as a member of the first state board of architectural examiners. So if you think you might have heard the name C.H. Page before, um, it's because He's the architect of our Williamson County Courthouse, right in the middle of the square, but he did a lot of work in Texas. So Page was one of the most prominent architects in Texas at the time. In partnership with his brother Lewis, and later with his son C.H. Page Jr., he established a reputation as one of the state's premier designers of public buildings. Among his firm's projects were the Texas Building at the St. Louis World's Fair, the John Seeley Hospital in Galveston, the Confederate Home in Austin, the Sweetwater Auditorium in City Hall, Austin Zilker Park and courthouses at Amarillo, Austin, Greenville, Memphis, San Marcos, and Sweetwater. The Page firm also designed the Williamson County Courthouse in Georgetown. In addition to the Georgetown High School, he helped design educational buildings in Temple, Del Rio, Beaumont, Orange, and Texas City. So quite a career and he's the designer of this school building that's come with us um, until today. So I have a lot of questions about why this style, because the Spanish colonial revival is not something that we have a lot of in Georgetown. And got my question answered. The Georgetown High School, which C.H. Page designed in the early 1920s, features Spanish colonial revival architecture. Prominent features include the mission parapets, red tile uh, roof, and elaborate cast stone detailing. And so it's got a lot of decoration on it. Um, and then, so the, the Panels on either side of the main entry have the dates 1922 and then what we see here 1923, but then additions include a gymnasium that was built in the 40s and the wood entrance doors were um, ultimately swapped out for aluminum entry doors. And this is way back in the 80s um, that wasn't part of the recent construction. So Page's use of Spanish colonial revival architecture is unusual in the context of Georgetown, but it represents the area's early historical ties to Spain. Although the Spanish designs dominate, there are minor detailing elements that show influences of the Art Deco style. And Art Deco would have been popular around this time, um, kind of very elaborate uh, kind of uh, detailing for lines and, and um, the Empire State Building is a really great example of Art Deco architecture, but you can find elements of it in other buildings. And so he was really pulling from a lot of influences, it looked like when he designed this, but possibly because of the building's elaborate style or perhaps because of uncooperative weather, construction of the Georgetown High School took longer than planned. Originally scheduled to be completed in time for the 1923 graduation exercises, the project continued on late into that year. 
In the 1923 yearbook, The Eagle, student D. Elizabeth Hodges recorded, after the holidays, the entire high school was demoted and we moved back into the grammar school. We endured the humiliation, however, and were willing to graduate the second time from grammar school as it meant the future seniors would have a new high school building from which they could graduate. A review of the newspaper files for the period 1922 to 1924 shows the students were not the only ones eager for the project to be completed. A headline on page one of the Williamson County Sun, August 24th, 1923, announced school to open after middle of September. But in September, a headline read, school opens October 1st. The following month, an article on the school noted that on account of the high school building being incompleted, all work for the immediate future will be conducted in the grammar school building. And in December, <laughs> under the headline, trustees accept new high school building, um, they observed how great uh, a building this was. It was very modern, great proportions. It had 15 classrooms, four laboratories, a teacher's restroom, cloakrooms, and all equipment for pursuing studies of every kind, individual lockers. I mean, it just went on and on about how great this school was. Um, and they had an auditorium that could seat 830 people in individual opera chairs. But despite the praise for the new building, the article mentioned that construction was still not complete. And on January 2nd, 1924, the school was finally dedicated uh, in a student faculty meeting. And among the speakers uh, at the ceremony were the superintendent of schools and then also um, Georgetown school board members. Um, so this was the Georgetown High School until 1975. Um, we got the high school that y'all may be more familiar with today. And here we've got a photo uh, of the 1938 high school football team. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, and we have enjoyed playing football in Georgetown for a very long time. But that's, uh, so that was kind of interesting to me that they had tried to get this and tried to get this. But Anne, help me understand, I imagine if you're a senior and you have this expectation that you're going to get to graduate from the brand new fancy high school and it doesn't even get completed then, but there was, I'm kind of confused about like, where did the students go while they were trying to finish this? Because it seems like they got demoted. What does that mean? They did. They got demoted to the grammar school, <laughs> which been a few blocks down. But the plus side was um, the Georgetown School District actually got approval from TEA to do half days. So the elementary um, went from eight to noon and then they were out. And then high school students went from 1230 to 4.30 for that first chunk of the 1923 school year. Okay. They didn't have to go to school all day. <laughs> um, so there, that, there was that plus side um, at least. That's really but They funny. were going down to the grammar school, which would have been one of those buildings that didn't come with us. Indeed. So, um, the Georgetown Public School, it was later known as Annie Pearl. Um, and this is actually the 1896 first graduating class from public schools in Georgetown. Oh, wow. It's a lot of girls. There's not very many boys by comparison, it looks like. Um, so it's kind of interesting dynamics and things that we think about. We don't necessarily think about people educating but when you're predominantly an agricultural community, the boys may choose to leave school earlier while the girls may continue on. And so, so Annie Pearl is actually one of the first graduates from Georgetown Public School System. Oh, okay. And then Annie, and then, Annie Pearl is a person. Um, Annie and a person Pearl is a plays, person. <laughs> that yes. has like kind of a really prominent role in Georgetown in, schools shaping Georgetown schools. Yes. So if you go, is it on the next slide that she is? She might be on the next. Ah, uh, no, not yet. Okay. Um, so we were kind of talking about this lead up to 1923. I kind of wanted to bring it back and relate it a little bit to what we're experiencing now. Um, so these are some things going on in October of 1918, which is when the Spanish flu impacts Georgetown. And so this might be a little bit too real right now, but at least we can take solace in the fact that it's happened before. We're not alone. Um, Georgetown actually voted to close schools for a couple of weeks in October when the Spanish flu very first arrived. 
And then they actually extend the closure for another full week. Um, and you can see the headline reads, probably be resumed Monday, because that's kind of the tentativeness that they're all at. At least now we can check online and we don't have to go get the paper to see. <laughs> That's true, but this this does feel really familiar. So I was really surprised when you showed me these news articles and, you know, with school being, um, you know, really a challenge because there was a lot of uncertainty, especially approaching this school year. What is school going to look like? Will it be a virtual learning experience? Will, will children be at school? You know, for college students, are you on campus? Are your, are your classrooms virtual? Um, so a little bit different scale, maybe not quite so many people, but still a lot of, they did have a, a, a pandemic going on and there was some uncertainty about what was the best step to take. And, and I hadn't realized that they had actually closed schools a little over a hundred years ago in response to what is um, kind of a similar event in some ways. A similar event, they closed schools. Southwestern locked down quite a bit. This is actually the same time that the hospital opens in Georgetown. And oh. we actually prepped to open because of anticipation of patients. Um, so they kind of sped up their opening for that. Um, it's actually noted in the uh, Southwestern yearbook that unfortunately they only got to play three football games that year because so many were canceled <laughs> because oh, wow. to limit crowd gatherings. That sounds um, really familiar too. Also really familiar. It's a lot of those same types of things. Unfortunately, um, for Georgetown, they were hit again, the school system in particular, six months later in April 1919, there's actually a breakout outbreak of smallpox. Oh, wow. And so the school district decides they shut down briefly and then they decide to vaccinate every single school student within the district. And this is the first time that we have documentation that Georgetown decided to inoculate students. Wow. that they required it. Um, so there's a lot happening in this kind of time frame, 1918, 1919, that might sound familiar today. So just kind of to pull uh, the past into the future a little bit there. And then um, something that we hopefully don't have to deal with. <laughs> this is that same time period, again, that the high school is being built all of this is happening and we have a rat epidemic in, in Williamson County. We've had minor outbreaks of this in the past few years in downtown Georgetown and Old Town. There was one uh, probably about a decade ago. There was one in Round Rock West uh, just a couple of years ago where the rat population just kind of explodes. And again, we're in a more agrarian society in the 1920s. So there's more food for the rat population to explode, but it also means the impact is heavier because it's impacting people's livelihoods and food sources as these rats destroy crops. Not to mention disease possibilities. And they're only, again, three years removed from this, these two outbreaks, one of the Spanish flu and one of smallpox. So they start one of my favorite little weird history things in Georgetown School District history, which is a rat killing campaign. And they are awarding $25 to students that collect the most rat tails. Whoa. And by the end of January, there are more than 40,000 tails that have been collected. It's only been about a two week period of time. Um, into February, there's at least 77,000 tails that have been collected. I'm so um, I'm overwhelmed just, by that number. That's a lot of that's, that's, that's a lot of rats. That's a lot of rats. <laughs> and how they actually got money to pay the students who won was they collected money from farmers because who has the most, you know, impetus to kind of like minimize the impact, it's the farmers. So of course they're more than willing to put up a couple of bucks for a student to go out and collect rat tails. That, that's just wild. Um, uh, as a teacher, at least, uh, if you are a teacher, at least you're not having to count rat tails. At least you're that's not counting rat tails. One positive, right? 
I mean, I can understand though that some enterprising students would see $25 reward and, oh, and, and get after it. Do we know absolutely. if students were skipping school in order to pursue rats? I've never found an account of anyone skipping school to pursue rats. I'm sure you could uh, collect a fair amount on your way to school. Um, at home, <laughs> of course. Here's, so, here's hoping that we won't be um, needing a program like that. Hopefully not. So the so, school that we're the school that we're talking about, the Georgetown Grammar School. Um, here's a great early photo of it. And those that 1920s photo for the first graders, those would have been some of those collecting the rat tails. Excellent. Um, so it, yes, seventy-seven thousand. I just. It's a little bit hard to process. <laughs> it is. It really is. Wow. Um, but this was, uh, so this is a school that was, um, we have an Annie Pearl Elementary today, but that's kind of the third iteration of Annie Pearl. And Annie Pearl um, is a person. And so this is the Annie Pearl that the school was named after. But this is did she graduate from this school and teach at this school? She or? did not graduate from this school. She actually graduated from the public school before this building. Okay. Um, and then by 1902, she's actually gone and received her um, teaching degree. And she's back teaching in Georgetown schools, which she does for about five decades. Wow. Um, she pretty quickly becomes the principal of the Georgetown Grammar School as well as the first grade teacher. So that's part of the reason I chose to uh, highlight that photograph of the first grade class because those would have been Annie Pearl's students so in addition to the ones catching the rat tails because it's 1920s. Um, and so she manned the school for until her retirement um, about 1949. And then she actually opened up a private uh, pre-K and kindergarten. Um, after that until that she operated until her death. Um, the school board actually chose to rename it in her honor while she was still principal, if that tells you a little bit about the impact she had on GASD. Wow, that is kind um, of unusual. Yes, it's very unusual. She brought in a lot of those elements that we think of as modern schooling. So she really believed in focusing on the entirety of the students so that art culture um, should all be incorporated into learning. It shouldn't just stri strictly be academic. She got us involved with the University Interscholastic League, UIL competitions. She formed PTAs. Um, she oh. kept, she formed the library at the school initially, but she also kept it open during the summer to promote summer reading so that students could continue to borrow books. Um, we'll get into a little bit of this later, but she actually at one point also implemented Spanish lessons for second through eighth graders um, for 30 minutes a day. Wow. So she had this huge impact on Georgetown schools. And as you know now, again, we still have an Annie Pearl school named in her honor. We do. Um, so if you aren't familiar with the building that we're talking about, this photo from around 1934, it is right up there front and center, right uh, on University Avenue between Austin Avenue and Main Streets. You would know that much better today as uh, the site of Dos Salsa's restaurant, Wells Fargo, the oil exchange. Um, and so that's where this building was. And this is a building that didn't come with us. Um, this is a building too that had a history and it looks like a really big building. I mean, it's three stories, but it had a history of overcrowding. And part of what I was reading is, you know, even back in 1917, there was concern about overcrowding and that was at this school. And so one of the things that I had read was that um, the school had so many students that they needed to accommodate that at some point the high school students were put in kind of an outbuilding on this site called the chicken coop. But here's the deal. I haven't been able to confirm the location of any additional structures on this site besides the outhouses. And so from the Sanborn maps, um, we can see this school, um, the earliest is 1900. And then I've got this photo from 1934, but we've got other Sanborn maps. I can never find this chicken coop structure that 
allegedly the high school students had to do classes in. It seems like the high school students were kind of always getting the short end of the stick. They were getting the brunt of it. Yes. I don't know where they had to go, but um, so did we did we put them in an outbuilding? I don't know. Um, the site did have gardens though um, for the children to, to grow gardens in. You can see some um, play equipment, probably closer to what we had for play equipment when I was a kid than what we do now. Um, kind of these like rough metal <laughs> things, the merry-go-round we used to try to knock each other off of and, and some pretty simple swing sets. But um, school was really right in the middle of town. Um, and then of course built the high school and, and then that's when we started to have multiple schools um, kind of lining up along University Avenue. And so you can see those two campuses here. This is from the 1964 aerial photo of Georgetown. In the box on the left, you can see the buildings that were just going up after this uh, building had been demolished. You can see the buildings that the oil exchange um, and Wells Fargo were in, this um, other building uh, that's been used for different purposes over the year, and the building that De Salsas is now in, which I remember is the LM Cafe, hadn't been constructed yet. You can see cars parking there. And then you can see the, uh, the elementary, excuse me, the high school with the football field behind it. And then you can see um, some additions kind of to the back of it. And that's of course surrounded by houses because it's part of our Old Town uh, Historic Residential Area. And so um, that's a school that didn't come with us, but it's not the only one. And we don't often, um, it's kind of hard to talk about buildings that aren't there anymore, but one of the things that we do want to talk about is the African American schools um, that we had also really close to downtown. Um, but like a lot of communities for a long time, Georgetown had a segregated school system. And so some of the buildings that were in the African American neighborhoods and, and were the African American schools also didn't come with us, but we do have a few photos and wanted to be able to talk about those today. So, and we have the 1916 Sanborn map that shows the high school. Um, and then also from what I understand, <laughs> schools just, we're always trying to find room for new students. This has been going on for over a hundred years, certainly. Um, and so what I understand is not only would students meet at the school, but they would also sometimes use the Masonic Lodge for classes that was just one block over um, because they had some, they had more students than they had building space. Um, yes, absolutely. The Masonic Lodge, as well as the Odd Fellows Lodge, which was right across the street as well, I've heard that as well. Um, again, so this is, this is up, uh, Timber Street has since been renamed to Martin Luther King Jr. Street. Um, and so where you see Timber, um, we're looking kind of up at the corner of MLK and Forth, um, or Forest and Forth Street. And so that's where um, we have the County Justice Center now. But at the time, this was um, kind of a, a hub of activity, and you can see churches, you can see social lodges, um, and then you can see the high school was here, and also a lot of houses. Um, and so, Anne, could you tell us a little bit about um, how the schools got started for African American students? So we know that there are segregated schools from a diary kept by um, Lizzie McMurray at least into the 80s. Into the 80s. There is at least a separate school from then onward. Um, it's not necessarily mandated by the state of Texas until the 1870s that the town maintain a separate school for African Americans, but we really start to get documentation of it in the early 1900s and the 1920s, and part of that is when S.C. Marshall um, comes to teach, and there he is, Professor S.C. Marshall in the early 1900s. Um, he really kind of does for what was renamed Carver eventually, but it's also commonly locally known as Marshall Carver. He does really what Annie Pearl did for the white school for Marshall Carver. He really expands it. He starts PTAs. He gets us, gets them involved in the Prairie View Interscholastic League, which was the segregated URL league. Um, and he expands vocational programs. He is instrumental in getting, for instance, this building built, which is one of the few photographs that we have of what Marshall Carver actually looked like. Um, and really advocating for the African American students within Georgetown. And he until was really, he, he was really well educated. He was well educated himself though. He had like yes. multiple college degrees. Um, I have three and he had more than I do. <laughs> And, and so 
we don't have a lot of pictures of that part of Georgetown, um, at least in the resources that, that we're um, used to having access to. But one of the things that we did um, see is that in this photo, I love to talk about the 1934 aerial photos, aerial meaning taken from an airplane flying around Georgetown. We have this great photo from 1934 and to get you oriented, um, you can see a kind of a, a wide road and bridges there on the upper right hand corner. Those are the Austin Avenue bridges over the San Gabriel River. They look a little bit different today than they did in 1934. So this is the Marshall Carver School that um, is kind of back at what would have been Second Street and MLK, I think. And so you can also see a church there on the left and then you can see um, a lot of houses and some other buildings. Um, this was taken kind of the library has um, a new parking lot on the north side of the library and so if you were flying right over that and then kind of looking a little bit to the northeast that's where that school um, used to be positioned and so we can see definitely this school matches the the other photo it's just kind of set back a little bit but that's where um, the african-american school was um, for students there and then in 1964 it was still there um, and so but a, there was a lot going on in the 50s and 60s in Georgetown Public School so Anne tell us a little bit about how the process of school integration in Georgetown and, and how that worked. So we'll talk a little bit in just a second about how integration actually happened twice kind of in Georgetown. Once was in 1948 and once was in the early 1950s. So Brown v. Board of course happens in 1950. Um, it doesn't require anyone to take immediate action. Uh, some of the earliest school districts that actually integrate within Texas are the really small school districts um, because it made sense for them not to maintain two separate schools. Larger districts like Georgetown was at the time it had grown substantially since the 1850s. It took quite often lawsuits, um, which did happen within Georgetown. Um, it took the Community for Better Schools initiative and a lawsuit both on the state and the federal level through plaintiffs um, of the Miller family to really integrate schools in Georgetown. Um, so there was a lot of debate about, there's was a lot of debate about whether or not integration should be carried out gradually or all at once. Georgetown ISD's initial plan was to add grade by grade, which would have Georgetown fully integrated in the 1970s. Unfortunately, um, there was also a lot of people that didn't want that to happen. And so there was a push to build a new segregated school um, to delay integration even further, if possible. So what happened was Marshall Carver in the early 60s, late 50s, was in such a state of disrepair that TEA was threatening to take away Georgetown ISD's accreditation. And this debate comes about in Georgetown about whether or not integration should just happen or they should build a separate segregated school. And there's a lot of back and forth. There's lawsuits that take place. Um, in 1962, the Community for Better Schools files the lawsuit with the aim of stopping construction on the new segregated school. Um, so the state case eventually decides that bond money could not be spent on segregated facilities. So what the impact of this on Georgetown is then that Westside School does eventually get built. Westside being what later became Carver Elementary. Um, and it is at first segregated, but there's free choice integration that's added in 1964. Um, and by 1965, 1966, so many students in the high school level in particular are choosing to attend Georgetown High School that Marshall Carver High School as we know it closes. And Georgetown is pretty much fully integrated, at least by free choice um, theory, by 1966-1967. So, so 
it's a very complicated history and it could easily fill up several of these. <laughs> and I am not doing it any justice um, at all. Um, so there's a lot more detail if you ever want to explore it further. There are um, oral histories on the library website that are completely um, about this entire process, the lawsuits that are occurring and how it all unfolds um, that are several hours worth that can go into great depth about how this process happened in Georgetown in particular. And so when we talk about school integration, we're also talking about students going to school in a school building. And so a lot of our building history is tied directly to um, the history of that, how that process happened. So what, if I understand what you're saying is that students went from the school that we had been showing, the school from the 1916 map and the 1934 photos, that's where you would have gone to high school if you were an African-American student yes. until schools integrated. And then you would have gone to this uh, high school that we're more familiar with because it's still with us today on University Avenue. So you kind of would have gone from one side of downtown over to another side of town to go to school. And then um, we have this campus that became the, the Carver School. Um, and then this is over at what's now 18th Street and Scenic Drive. You don't see Scenic Drive because it wasn't constructed in 1964 yet. Um, and so that school then um, was kind of built around the time that all of these changes were happening, but it did become one of the elementary schools for Georgetown ISD. Yes. And then it got added on to quite a bit later um, because if, the, if what you're seeing uh, in, the, in the red box doesn't quite look like what was there, it's because this is very different. Again, we didn't have scenic drive back then that hadn't been constructed yet. What you're seeing are dirt roads, not all of Georgetown's roads were paved yet, and this area had not yet been paved. Um, and so, and then there were some additions that were constructed with that school later on, um, as we're constantly trying to make enough room for all of our school students, um, which is something that goes on still today. Um, so I think that is an important history for us to talk about, and certainly one um, that, again, is, is really expressed through our buildings. Another building that got um, constructed, oh, there we go, 1974. It's a little bit more clear of a photo. You can see a baseball diamond um, just kind of to the southwest of the school building, but that was before the later additions that you might be more familiar with today. So there's another school um, that also um, hasn't come with us in the sense that um, I'm not even exactly sure where this school was located but we didn't just have um, separate schools for African-American students. We also had separate schools for Mexican students. Um, and so this is a photo of La Escuela Mexicana or the Mexican school in 1922. That's what it was called. Um, and there's a Professor Carter from Southwestern. So Anne, do you know, was it a Southwestern professor who was teaching at the school? So it actually um, came under Annie Pearl. Pearl was actually in charge of both what it was called the Mexican school and the white school. Um, so she was the one that was contracting out uh, teachers and things like that throughout its history. 19, the early 1920s is when we received like some of the first information about this school. Um, and so there was some initial um, collaboration between the school and between local churches. So that's maybe where some of the crossover is happening with um, Professor Carter as well. Although you do have a lot of a documentation of Southwestern students working at this school, at the Mexican school throughout its history. It's interesting because the relationship is a little bit different with, between the Mexican school and GISD than it is between Marshall Carver and GISD. So Marshall Carver was almost its own little self-sustaining bubble in a way, especially because of Professor S.C. Marshall and the different principles that they had there. Um, they were able to create things like PTAs, to create teachers associations. Um, the Mexican school, because it was under Annie Pearl, she often included their teachers in the same kind of collaboration as the white school. So it's a lot more integrated even from the get go. Um, after third or fourth grade, uh, students from the school could actually attend Georgetown Grammar and then go on to Georgetown High School. 
um, and we see instances of that definitely happening. But by 1948, this school has closed. We know that they have just fully integrated into the white school here in Georgetown by that time. So it's interesting, there's two different kind of dynamics at work here um, and the different ways that the Mexican school interacted with Georgetown Grammar and GISD versus Marshall Carver. Um, there was a lot more support for the Mexican school than there was for Marshall Carver from and the so, school district. So from um, the book Recuerdos Mexicanos, which is a history of Hispanic culture in Georgetown, Texas, um, they talk about this school, um, I believe the one in the photo being at the corner of 10th and Bridge Street near the San Gabriel River. And so um, what we need to remember too is that Highway 29 was not always the way that we got across the South San Gabriel River. Um, and so there was um, a different crossing and we're probably going to have to go more into that in a later um, episode of our talks because that the way that we got across the rivers was really important. And, and this, so this school, rather than kind of being on, in a different part of town, this school was um, actually not very far away from the Marshall Carver School. And, um, and then, but it's, it's a building that I haven't been able to find any evidence of. Um, I don't know that I, there are any photos that I've been able to find other than this one. Um, and so, but it sounds like the students were integrated into the, the Georgetown school system and into those other school buildings um, earlier. Um, I think you said 1948. And so here's one more school that hasn't really come with us in this form. Um, these are kind of the, the brand new photos of it from 1954. And we mentioned earlier that there have been Kind of three iterations of Annie Pearl, and this would be iteration number two. So this is the Annie Pearl that I'm more familiar with. Um, this is, uh, so in 1954, when we were building school buildings, um, this is a period of time in which we were really moving away from traditional looking buildings. And we were going with this modern movement, um, things that looked and felt a little bit space agey, if you will. And you can certainly see that here. A um, lot of glass, a lot of windows, and um, it's just really a very different look from all of the other school buildings that we've been um, seeing the photos of so far. And I found these photos in the Portal to Texas History, which is a really great online digital resource for um, historic photos. Portal to Texas History is an online collection. It's just portal, portaltotexashistory.com, um, I think. Just Google it, but it's a, a online digital archive that is kind of, um, fed by so many different um, universities and, and museums and other organizations. And so it looks like they probably took these photos of the very early Annie Pearl classes. Um, and these students are really, really looking interested in their books. Um, more so, I probably never set that still um, at that age in school. But uh, this is kind of, uh, I kind of stumbled across these and thought, wow, what a difference between this very, very modern looking school and the schools that we've been looking at, which look a lot more traditional. Brendan Ann, that was awesome. Uh, always good to hear the really interesting stories y'all dig up. We have about 18 folks on joining us through Zoom. We have another 20 or so on Facebook. Uh, do y'all have a minute or two for questions? Absolutely. So uh, there is a chat function. You're welcome to use that to post a question if you have any. Otherwise, um, if you'd like to um, unmute yourself and ask that question, uh, or if you need help uh, unmuting your microphone, just you can also raise your hand, which is a, um, a function uh, that should be available to you as well. And while everybody's thinking about questions, um, just remember that there is a whole lot more to schools. Um, and so Southwestern has some really great photos. Um, and if you want to get into the evolution of that campus, um, it wasn't always all the buildings and trees that you see today. They did used to have a football field. Um, and then uh, there were some pretty wonderful houses on the Southwestern campus. 
some of our old town, like really fabulous old homes used to be fraternity and sorority houses back in the 1920s. We know that from the yearbook. So um, always good to kind of do some research, have a look at how things used to be. Southwestern even used to have a Glamazon club for female students. The girls had to be over five feet, seven inches to be in the club. I would not qualify, I'm too short. Um, but this is kind of <laughs> a fun, uh, a fun thing that you can find if you're looking through Southwestern's yearbook archives. And so just remember too, there are just, there's so many resources and so many people that have been critical to our school history. And we even memorialize that on, uh, in one of our city's murals. So this is on the back of city hall. Um, this is Mary Bailey who played an incredible role as a preschool educator in Georgetown. Um, and so be sure to remember there's lots of great resources. If you need links to any of that, or if you need additional information, please feel free to contact us. So we have our phone numbers posted here and you can also email historic at georgetown.org. If you want a direct link to any of the resources that we've talked about, just email us and we'd be glad to send you those links if you're curious about how you can follow up because we covered a lot today. Um, and so- Barely yeah, scratched the surface. <laughs> and, and there's just so much more. And you know, if you think about, we have, almost 170 years of school history in Georgetown. That's a lot to cover. And it's so fascinating to me that so much, you know, so much of our history happens in buildings. And I'm often so surprised when buildings don't come with us. Um, sometimes I'm really shocked, like how could they have torn that down? Um, but our attitudes have really changed over time um, about preserving buildings and about keeping buildings. And a lot of this happened before the National Preservation Movement really got going and, and before um, we really started working on preservation in Georgetown. So if you wonder why we do this work, it's so that we don't lose any more buildings uh, than we already have, hopefully, um, because some of those were, were pretty wonderful. So Nat, did we get any questions? or It looks like we have a hand raised. Oh, great. Looks like Tom, are you there still? Yeah, I'm still here. Did, did you, did Britain, did you talk about our house and, and how it was used uh, it was kind of curious that there was a reference to it in that last meeting that you had the variants that they said they went to school in that a frame building that was across the way or around the corner. Oh, no, um, we didn't. And so uh, Tom has a house that's very close to that uh, school campus, which <laughs> was the fitting school of the preparatory school. And then it uh, became Georgetown High School. Um, and so, Tom, do you have information to share about that? Well, the, the, uh, it was used as a classroom. The guy that owned the building, the Elaine Riley House, apparently was the first uh, uh, minister for Southwestern. And then they also had a school in that building that the, and the kids were there. It's a two story, but there was a reference to the uh, in the uh, uh, narrative on Ash Street that the, the kids went to school there. But I didn't know if you had any anything else that you knew how many kids went there or how long was the school? No, but I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering if that was kind of, um, so Eidman had talked about a school with about 15 to 20 students. And do you, it, does that kind of fit for a size for you? Because students used to take up a lot less room than they do today. <laughs> well, Everybody no. had to crowd on benches, I think. Well, I think that they could have, they could have had up to 50 in there because that front room was extremely, you know, it's like 30, 38 by 17. I mean, it's bigger than the average classroom. So uh, they could have had people there, but I, I didn't know if you knew any history other than what was on the Texas Historic Commission site. I don't, but that's really interesting. And so, um, I, and I think to kind of highlight something that we didn't have time to cover today, but how many of the houses in our Old Town Historic District have associations with students, with faculty, with, um, there were a lot of borders. Um, and so a lot of times when we look at houses today, we, we tend to think, oh, well, this is a house now. It would have been a house this whole time. But Tom, I think you're bringing up a good point. Buildings just kind of had to serve a function. And some buildings you, you may have had school during the week and church on the, on the weekend or on Sundays or um, you, our city hall, in fact, was a building that served as a city hall and a fire station, and they had church on Sundays. And so um, a lot of times we needed multi-purpose buildings. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if um, houses um, that we really think of as just houses 
had some other uses, especially kind of back earlier uh, when we didn't have as many buildings as we do today. Because your house is very old and was built at a time that um, kind of uh, these, when these black muddy streets <laughs> were what we had, um, according to this firsthand account. So, and we definitely well, have a lot of accounts of, especially students who are working to pay tuition maybe to Southwestern or the preparatory school, educating younger students for a little bit of money. And so especially when the public schools were not great, um, do you have accounts of those higher education students saying, okay, I'll teach your kid how to read and write if you pay me X and then it'll go towards my tuition. Yeah, Britton, I think the front room was added as a school and they lived in the, the center in the back portion, but that's just a wild guess. I like that guess. I think we're going to have to do some more digging to, to figure out if we can, if we can get a, a, better, a better story there, because I'm really interested in pursuing that. Um, so this is, this is a great example, too, of why we love to do this work, because we get excellent feedback. Um, we, we can't know everything, and so the more stories that are shared with us, the more we can share with y'all, and then also the better we can understand the wonderful buildings that are still with us today. Tom's house is a great example of that. Um, Tom has one of the oldest uh, houses that we still have um, in Old Town, and he's taking really, really great care of it. And his house is a recorded Texas historic landmark, too. So one of those um, kind of very specially designated structures. Thanks so much for that, Tom. I really appreciate you um, talking about that because that makes sense to me um, in many ways, um, especially having seen your house, which uh, is is painted white and kind of has that, um, it definitely kind of conjures up that whitewash school imagery for me. So I like that connection. Okay, my any, you. I'm sorry. I said my pleasure, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't see any more hand raises. We're a little over our time. Uh, appreciate uh, you sharing what you guys know. And um, for all those who are joining us, we'll be posting uh, this webinar to the historic.georgetown.org if you want to watch it again or share it with your friends. And please make sure to join us next month, Britton and Ann. Um, any sneak peeks about what we're talking about next month? I don't want to give it away until I know if I can get the photos I'm looking for. So stay tuned. We'll, we'll post it. It's, it's a it's lot about... contingent on photos. <laughs> it, it's a lot about what, how fast can we get some of the photos that we want to use to tell the story. Um, but it'll be a good one. And we just thank you all so much for joining us um, to talk about Georgetown history, our favorite thing. Okay. See you next Thanks. month.